Welcome to the podcast, my friends. I got a great episode for you today. But first, this episode is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health have negative impacts from the coronavirus, from anything going on in your life right now. Maybe they've affected your job, your social life, your well-being. If you're struggling through the pains of addiction right now or mental health disorder, uh, now's the time to seek the help that you need. Why wait? Don't put it off. Let this be the opportunity to get back on track and help getting your life back together. Uh, You're not alone in this. I've been there. Uh, Our guest Vance has been there today. So many others out there have been right where you're at, right in your shoes, right in that moment. And uh, I just want to let you know there's plenty of resources out there and Promises Behavioral Health is here as well. I've worked personally with these guys now for a couple of years. I know them personally. They have friends, family in recovery. And they're great people. They care. And it's an option that you can trust. So uh, if you want to learn more, if you have questions about yourself, about your family member, here's what you can do. Uh, you can go to promises, behavioralhealth.com slash sober guy. Uh, and uh, they've created a great web page over there of our partnership. We went out to Arizona uh, last year, uh, myself, Jess, and the kids. And we represented families in recovery to let you guys know that 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 hope is there, uh, change is there, it's possible. And so they put a great web page together uh, beyond that with some of the photos from that and just some great resources there. So you can check that out. Or if you want to just call, you can call 888-205-1890. That's 888-205-1890. Tell them that you heard about them from That Sober Guy podcast. Uh, let me give you a couple quick resources and then we're going to jump into today's podcast. Uh, My sponsor, Buddy C, you've heard him on the podcast many times, great friend of mine. Uh, He runs an online daily AA Zoom meeting. It's every night at 6 p.m. That's 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Got a bunch of great people in there. You can go to zoomaameetings.com. You can jump right in there. If you do need a password code, it is on my Instagram. I don't have it right in front of me, but it's at real that sober guy. You can find it on there in the little ID code once you're in, once uh, you're in. Uh, Also, Rooted uh, Alumni, uh, Promises Alumni Community. They have weekly meetings on the Zoom platform as well. Uh, They're welcome to uh, people in all forms of recovery, no matter what you're recovering from or what brought you to recovery. And uh, you can go to promisesbehaviorhealth.com slash rooted, and you can get that calendar there and uh, you can see what meeting or meetings uh, works best for you. Uh, Of course, plenty of podcasts. We have plenty of them here. I got a lot of good friends, uh, Recovery Elevator, Dopey Podcast, um, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, out there to choose from that you can help stay connected. We have the 90 day sobriety course at that sober guy.com. And then of course our friend Vance today is going to share some of his re- uh, resources uh, that he has available to you as well. Uh, so let's, uh, let's stop right there. I'm glad you're here today. We got some great stuff. I'm really excited about this conversation and let's start the show. That sober guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Raymer. You're listening to that sober guy podcast, and we have some fun around here. And of course, we help people stay sober. Uh, be sure to check us out at thatsoberguy.com. You can connect with us on Instagram at Real That Sober Guy and on Twitter at Shane Raymer. I always say I still don't know how to use Twitter very well. Apparently, it's the easiest platform to use, and I'm just a goofball, I guess, when it comes to it. So, Instagram best place. Once again, it's at Real That Sober Guy on Instagram. Our guest today is Vance Johnson, and Vance is a former NFL football player who played for the Denver Broncos from 1985 to 1995. Uh, he's got a book out titled Uncovered: Why Becoming Less Became Everything. Uh, where he explains how hiding a serious alcohol and pill addiction cost him literally everything he had. Uh, Today, Vance is a recovery advocate and rehabilitation ambassador with Oglethorpe Incorporated and recently opened the Vance Johnson Recovery Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is really cool. I was checking out the website today and some of those photos on there, man. It looks like a great place. Uh, Vance, it's an honor to have you on the podcast today, man. I'm finally glad we got to connect. Thank you, my friend. How are you? Sober guy, what's up, man? I'm so excited to be on the show with you, man. You are so well known and what you're doing and your transparency. I'm honored to be on your program today. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I I, I really do appreciate that. You know, uh, we take these topics that um 
uh, nobody wants to talk about a lot of the time, you know, and, and, and just kind of hit them the best we can head on and, uh, and create some, some good conversation around them. Hopefully we help some people. So, um, yeah. glad, glad to have you here today. You have a lot going on. want to get into a little bit about your background and, and your story, obviously football, a big part of your story, a big part of your life, and then transition now into, uh, recovery and really leading the way and helping others, uh, get sober and, uh, and stay sober. I have one quick question. I saw your sobriety date is in September of 2013. Mine is the same, September of 2013 as well. So we got sober right around the same time. Wow. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I'm September 11th, just for the record. Right on You're there. September 11th? Yeah. Yep. I'm around the 20th. Nice. Oh, yeah. So we're, we're uh, man, we're just within 10, 10 or so days, man. That's cool. Praise God, brother. That's awesome. Yeah. So so what's going on? Tell us a little bit about, and we'll, maybe we'll backtrack a little bit, but there's a lot going on. You just opened the Vance Johnson Recovery Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. Tell us a little bit about that first, man. I was really interested yeah, in that. Absolutely. Well, as Oglethorpe ambassador for a company that uh, deals with uh, people that are suffering with mental illness around the country, they have programs all over the country, whether it's Ohio, all the way to the East Coast, Texas, Louisiana. And now the Vance Johnson Recovery Center, as their ambassador, they open up a uh, program in my namesake, but I'm actually here and I live here. And during this COVID-19 thing, we're still in our accreditation period. Got so it. I'm living at the center. So I'm one of the only ones here besides really? my director who shows up once in a while. And so I'm look, really looking forward to opening up and partnering with yourself and people all over the West Coast so we can just keep offering and sharing hope to people that need treatment. And I'm one of those pro athletes, man, where I'm not just putting my name on a building. Yeah. I'm here. I spend time with people. I do interventions. I pick them up at the airport. I'll go get them. I'm just like you. Yeah, man. I love it. I love it. I know I could have, well, we, we chatted a little bit uh, before today or whatever, just briefly, but um, I could always tell. And of course, some of the the video, there, there was a video that someone from your team had sent me to. Um, you know, that involved the loss of your son, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit. That's a part of your story as well. And, um, I could feel the passion, man. And I just appreciate you saying that. And I appreciate you being upfront and so honest about that. You're not just doing this to slap your name on a building to get some good PR. Like this is what you like to do. This is what you're passionate about. And God has really given you this second chance, the second platform to help people. And it's pretty dang amazing. Yeah, it's been it's been amazing. And just like yourself, and we talked about it a little early before the show, how even though we get tired because we're doing this all day long, it actually uh, bolsters up and fixes us up even more so in our recovery. Yeah, because this is what we're all about now. This is not something necessarily you want to go get educated to do. This is something that if you fall into it and you come out of it, you stay in it so you can keep yeah. leading people out of the hell and yeah. that bondage of addiction, man. So by the grace of God, I'm free. I'm yeah. free indeed. Yeah, God, God uses the broken. That's just the, oh, you know. God. Come on, man. Start preaching. Start <laughs> I know. preaching. Yeah, it's, uses uh, the broken. That's exactly right. That's my does. next devotional. Oh, yeah, that's good. I like it. I like it. Yeah. And it's funny, though, too, like when, when, when we're going through that time, when we're grinding that out, when things are just, you know, maybe we're at our lowest point or we're just really going through it. It's so hard to see at the time, obviously, right? We're just we're in it, you know, and Absolutely, um, man, when, yeah, when you're in it, you're, you're blinded, yeah. you know, and uh, to the point where you feel like just killing yourself, man. Yeah. And uh, that's why I can't wait to share my, you know, my story. You know, what I'll do is I'll start from the top and kind of go down yeah. and that kind of show people that just because I tried to an achieve an identity that once you get famous and once you get popular and once you get rich, you're still empty. Yeah. So, okay. So, so let me set this up and I'm going to give you the floor and, and Vance, you're going to roll with it. So, um, you, I, I put this in the notes here too, man, like looking back, you like at the time, just a straight winner, NCAA champ, long jumper, second round selection in the NFL draft, three times to the Super Bowl, Denver Broncos, Olympics. Olympics. I mean, just, just got it going on, man. And, and so what, what, what happened? What's, what's your story? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, what I'll do is I'll start at the top and then I'll kind of go backwards. So, you know, becoming that famous person, literally I was so empty that everyone only saw the edited version. And so my, my identity was on the football field, was winning track meets, was winning gold medals, was making touchdowns, and was the fame. Sorry about that, man. Let me uh, – Oh, you're good. Did I lose you? No, you're cool. I, can, I still have audio anyways. Yeah, that's cool. Perfect. Okay, great. Keep yeah, going. People, uh, people me up all the time, just like I'm sure they blow you up all the time. So I'll have to keep pushing that button. <laughs> but uh, So that edited version of me was just really uh, uh, where I wanted to be in life, 
But unfortunately, when I was there, the only way I could cope with life after I was off the football field or after I was off the track field was by leaning on addiction. And I didn't call it addiction at the time. I just called it a drink. Yeah. I just called it a pill. I just called it a little bit of weed. I just called it something that made me feel good, right? So then I'd go out and I'd party and I'd have a good time. I'd get in car accidents, but because I was famous, I'd give game tickets to the cop. Oh. Uh, I crashed one time, man, and ended up going into a hospital and I was high. And so I begged the doctors not to let the police officers know because they came to get me. And so they hid me down by a morgue. I mean, this was crazy, man, during my career. I got arrested several times, but it wasn't really that publicized. I had a lot of domestic issues where I was so high one day after finding out that my wife was cheating on me, man, that I pushed her across the bed and I was punching the walls and she ended up hitting her head against the closet door and she wasn't breathing. Mm. Literally, I thought she was dead. And so I had a lot of issues during my career that, you know, today people are hearing about a lot more. But back then, they only yeah. saw the edited version, not the person that was suffering, not the person that literally when he came home from a, a Super Bowl after going to three of them, here's one of my accidental times of trying to kill myself right oh, here, man. man. So, wow. dude, I, I wanted to die, man. I did wow. everything I could to try to figure out how to leave this earth because I was so unhappy and so broken. Now I'll go to the underlying issues. And that's exactly what many of you know your viewers are going to be able to identify with when it comes to my story and your story where there are these underlying issues that caused us to be who we became when we wanted to use because that was the only way we can cope with life. Yeah. So as a child, I grew up around a lot of domestic violence. I grew up around a father who was a military guy who used, who was a wife beater, who cheated on my mom, who was always drunk and always high. Mm. And so I hated him as a kid and I didn't want to be like him. So I grew up really traumatized. And the only way that I found fulfillment in my life was by just like kids now watching television yeah. watching sports watching something that made me say you know what i have a dream to be famous one day i want to be rich that's going to make me somebody and then i want to be around this b crap that i'm growing <laughs> up around because i hate this yeah. and so i wouldn't go to my birthday parties as a child man i would run away from home all the time i would sneak in dad's room to see what he had going on in there I found magazines with naked women. So I started out with pornography really early. I would watch people having sex on videos, but because I was a shy person, I wasn't using drugs. I didn't have any relationships. And so long story short, as I grew up as a kid traumatized, I started to just live inside of my head to be famous. And so what I would do is just like right now doing this COVID-19 where people are isolated and they're spending a lot of time alone. Well, when I was isolated, when I was spending a lot of time alone, all I did was work out, do push-ups and run, 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 and just make myself, I want to be great. And so this was my goal as a child. And by the time I got to junior high school and the high school, I was one of the best in the country. I started competing around the world. I went to Caracas, Venezuela as a teenager, and I ended up, ended up winning a gold medal. So here I am, the number one in the world in the long jump, in track meets when I was in high school. And everything I did was about winning, about fame, and about one day having security and being famous. Hmm. Unfortunately, by the time I made it to college, I still hadn't drank alcohol. I still hadn't taken any pills. I hadn't smoked no weed. I started a relationship for the first time, a serious one. Ended up getting a girl pregnant, man. And her dad told me to quit sports and take care of his daughter. And I said, bye, Felicia, because I want to be <laughs> famous. I ain't got time for that. Yeah. So I cheated on her and got another girl pregnant, and I'm at the long story short here. So before I even make it to the NFL, I got two women pregnant, and I'm not even in my own children's lives mm. because I grew up not knowing how to be a father, not knowing how to be in a relationship because to me it was about making an identity. Well, by the time I blew Jerry Rice away in the 40 and beat, beat Carl Lewis in the long jump and went to the Olympics as an alternate, I ended up having to make a choice, NFL or Olympics. Mm. So I went to the NFL, and – my first game of my career, I ended up fumbling a ball, and I was told I was, told I was going to get cut. Mm -hmm. So by the time we made it back to Colorado, man, I was so broken because I was thinking about all the crap that I grew up around. Yeah. My only way to cope and deal with that was by using. And so I started using on the way to the final cut, and I didn't get cut, oh, and I was wow. still high. So then I'm like, oh, my Dang. goodness. So whenever I'm not feeling good, I can just have a drink. And then I got introduced to painkillers. So now I'm taking different types of opioids and opiates to 
to coke. And then I started smoking weed, man. I'm like, I'm having a blast now. And so that made me even play better on the field because then when I was high, I was reckless. And so I was making touchdowns. I was just, I was like making all the winning catches, man. Yeah. So to me, this was normal, right? This was my normal, not realizing that I was trying to cope with life on life's terms by using. Another long story short, do you know, man, I was married four times out of the 10 years and three Super Bowls that I went to in the NFL? Wow. Because to me, since I didn't know how to be in a relationship, if someone didn't make me feel good about what I wanted, I ended up cheating on them or I would divorce them and marry another woman and I would cheat on them. And I had babies. I had three women pregnant at the same time during my career. Three women pregnant. My wife, somebody else's wife, and another girl. So I have three sons right now today, man, that are 34 years old, all the same age. Wow. So my life was so chaotic during my career that the only way I could cope and deal with all these things was to use when I yeah. wasn't playing ball. And it was kind of held a secret. And when people did find out about it, because I was famous, nobody really wanted to tell Vance Johnson to stop yeah. doing what he was doing. And it wasn't until after the 10-year mark in three Super Bowls that I was so broken and broke financially that I just walked away from the game. Mm. And then when I didn't have an identity, the only place to go, guys, was down. Down. And I literally, when I didn't have an identity anymore, I had to lean on more addiction. So at this point, I'm taking Adderall, I'm taking a Tylenol PM, man. I'm taking everything I can, Seroquel, I'm taking antidepressant medications, I'm smoking weed, I'm drinking at least a pint or two or three a day minimum. I'm doing anything I can to not feel the brokenness that I had. And it got to a point where one day, and I'm doing a long story short, guys, seven marriages, seven marriages. My son came over, he went to college to live where I was living at. I wasn't in this life like I should have been. I was paying for him to go to school, but he ended up trying to get a hold of me and he couldn't, I'm sure, and ended up taking his motorcycle and he got killed the very same night. Mm. I mean, it's hard to even talk about this because every time I share the story about my son, I stay broken. And I'm actually glad I stay broken because it's my fault that my son died. And the only way I coped with my son dying is just like the people that are watching your show right now deal with the loss of a loved one. We use more. Mm. So I did more drugs. I did more relationships. I, I, did, I did more of everything to try to fill the emptiness inside of me. And it got to a point where I was just so done and so fed up with all of my life that I wanted to just kill myself. Mm. So I was driving to a canyon one day, man, and just screaming out to God to help me. And Eventually, after somehow I calmed down, my seventh ex-wife then had reached out to the NFL. They called a former Tampa Bay Buccaneer who called me and told me that they would help me get into treatment. I was $1 million in debt. Now, if anybody is watching right now that was a $1 million in debt, make sure you click that you were also a $1 million in debt. So breaking seven women's hearts, it being my fault that one of my children died, I'm a million dollars in debt. I had nothing to live for, but God, for some reason, had grace on my life that I heard a voice in my head one day when I was crying out to God in this canyon driving that I needed to get away from me. Mm. And I listened to it. And I got on the airplane and I flew out to Florida. The NFL paid for it. And I started to listen to the stories of the other people that were in treatment. And the strangest thing is I start hearing my story. I start seeing how people were dealing with these underlying issues and a lot of trauma that they grew up in and around. And the only way they cope was by leaning on addiction. Mm -hmm. I also learned that mental health was a big problem with the majority of the people who suffered with addiction problems. And I had mental illness, you know, a person that's suicidal and a person that's using drugs and alcohol and doing anything he can to just leave this earth is a person that's struggling. The other thing I started doing was this. I started to read my Bible. And I started reading this Bible and how Jesus Christ came to die for the broken. He came to die for the sinner. He came to die for the person that was doing the stealing and the cheating and the lying. He came to die for those who needed him. And so that's the reason why I knew that this must be the only purpose that I'm alive is to do something that's greater than myself and to turn myself over to a power greater than myself. And that's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I could have taken a whole hour to share the story, guys, because I got so much that I could go through. 
so that we can identify with each other. But that's the gist of what's happened to me in my life. And only by the grace of God now, I made a promise that I would go around and share hope to all those who suffer with mental illness and with drug addiction mm-hmm. to let them know that hope is there and you can be free from that bondage. And to trust me and to trust my guy, sober guy, because we know because we've been through it. Mm-hmm. And we, instead of living life happily ever after, after we left treatment, we're standing by the door of recovery, taking people in and showing them the way out of the hell that they're having to live in. And so with that long story short, brother, I'm going to pass it back on to you. I'd love to answer some questions, man. Yeah, yeah, that's good, man. Thank you, Vance, so much for uh, your honesty and just going through and breaking some of that stuff down. I think I set... I think I set the record on the show for how many wows I said during the time that you were saying, wow, wow. I mean, good. Like that's, it's, it's such a, uh, it's such a testament. Like we said earlier, God, God uses broken people that redemption, uh, is possible. Redemption Mm. is, uh, is there for anyone who is willing, able, uh, and for most of us at a point of uh pure desperation and it sounds like in, in your moment that's where it was at it was just pure desperation and and i know for me i was people ask how how you got sober why you got sober i just felt exhausted i felt 100 percent exhausted i knew god had something more for my life and uh you as well it turns it around and and now you know what i mean now we get to get back so um one uh w- one quick question i have um i guess to kind of kick us off here um you mentioned when you were a kid growing up, alcoholism, um, K- I, I, I call it chaos. It was like a controlled chaos or uncontrolled chaos, whatever you want to put it in my own situation, I guess. And I feel like there's so many of us that are in recovery that have been through that, have come from broken homes and had a lot of some trauma as kids. What is it, do you think, um, that makes us kids that have been through stuff like that feel the need to want to be known or famous or liked or um there's this certain there's this certain uh feeling that y- you just feel like you want to be seen do you know what i'm talking about i mean I, you, you I mentioned exactly it a little bit and I, I, about, I would just man. love to hear your your take on that I, I know exactly what you're talking about from childhood the very thing we're looking for is an identity mm. and so if we don't see our identity in our father or our mother or if we say, I don't want to have that identity, right? It won't come out in those terms. It'll just come out like, I don't want to be like him when I grow up. Yeah. Right? So then you start hearing these voices. Of, well, then who the hell are you? Mm. Right? You ain't nobody. And then if you don't get attention from your mother or your father, and if you don't get the attention that you need to kind of grow you up, then you start looking for ways to make yourself and have an identity. Yeah. And so that's why when I was a kid, to me, an identity had to be something that was achieved. And it wasn't until recently that I start realizing an identity is not something achieved. It's something received. And that's the reason why I know who I am in my walk with my, my faith in Christ, because my identity, knowing who I am now, if I had known that as a child, then life would have been a lot easier. I would have been able to, you know, do a lot more things in my life, but actually I wouldn't have my life, your life, your purpose was to be broken. Just like you said earlier, to be broken. Because when you got broken, that's when you found your identity. Yeah. And now you're able to use that brokenness as your purpose to go out and share hope with people. I mean, think oh, about it, guys. Good. Everybody out there that's in recovery, everyone out there that you know that's suffering, their whole purpose in life is to use what they're going through as their testimony. Mm. Because otherwise, what will be? What, what's our use for on this earth unless we're here for a bigger purpose than just ourselves? Yes, we want to be successful. We want to have families. We, you know, we want stuff. But what is it all for? Well, it's all so that we can show somebody else how to deal and cope and live in life, in life's trauma and, and the trials that we go through. And this is where I got to preach at you. That's why I'm a man of faith, because Jesus Christ said this. In this life, you will have trials. You will have sorrows. You will have tribulations. But in me, you will have peace because I've conquered the world. Now, when he said, I conquered the world, that didn't mean he was going to make you rich and famous and prosper. That meant that you can have hope in him that even though you're going to go through the trials, just like COVID-19, you're going to go through the tribulations, you're going to go through the sorrows and the grief from people turning their backs on you, but you're going to know that you have peace Mm. and that this life is going to be hard and you can endure it so that you can raise your children up the right way and teach them when they're young 
things are going to get tough, young man, when you get older. So daddy's going to show you how to do it now. Yeah, young lady, I don't want you to just dating any guy just because he's famous and got big muscles, right? <laughs> I mean, we're supposed to raise kids a certain yeah. way, but I wasn't raised that way. I was raised with a father sticking his PP in everybody and coming home drunk mm. and then punching my mother in the face and me watching it. Mm. I was raised with him coming home and me not wanting to be around him. So I would run away from home during, for my birthdays. I wouldn't even stay home for my birthdays, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I, literally, I could have talked for two hours, but I just, I'm just i just excited to be here with you and, and yeah. sharing with uh, your, your viewers, man. I love you guys so much. And I'm going to tell you right now, and you can't take it off because it's live. <laughs> Jesus Christ loves you. Oh, and he came it. for the broken. That's good, man. That's good. Um, let, so let, let's let's touch on this really quick, or let's dive a little bit into this. I think this is a great point you just bring up, and it's it's very personal to me too. I became very good at running. Uh, a lot of us become very good at running, and so yeah. even when we get sober, even when we start to change, whether we're still going through it or whether we're in that process, constantly in process, right? Um, I I myself can still even tend to want to run through certain situations, whether it's a relationship um, or wh whether it's just a hardship, whatever. How do you think that, uh, how do you think is a good approach? Um, at least I guess recognizing, recognizing it is number one. Um, but in those times when, when the going gets tough, um, you know, what, what are some good, some, what's some good advice you might have for someone out there struggling? Well, I'll tell you right now, during this COVID thing, man, Alcoholism is up, you know, suicide is up, domestic violence is up, you know, people are smoking more weed, they're taking more drugs than ever. Yeah. And me and you being in recovery, you know, we're, we're ground zero, man, because we already know the stuff that we had to deal with in our past. And so, you know, there are people out there right now who are in early recovery, who may have lost a job, mm -hmm. who somebody's pointing at and saying, if you had just had your crap together, we yep. wouldn't be in this mess today. And so we're still having to cope and deal with that stuff. The social isolating. I mean, I'm literally here at my treatment center with 66 beds and I'm alone most of the time here. Mm -hmm. So these fiery darts come in my head all the time. I was just at a CVS here in Las Vegas and I walked through the CVS man and there was liquor. They sold alcohol and all of a sudden these thoughts start coming in my head. Mm -hmm. And then when I drove down the street, I had my windows open and I smelled weed and I saw a dispensary. So, there are lots of temptations that come at me, yeah. but instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to yield myself over to that, which I always yield myself over to my fleshly desires. Now what I do is I fast on life. Mm. And I know that all those things led to the wrong decisions in my, in my life and in my head before in my past. And I wasn't going to follow those voices anymore. It's now I actually look forward to all those tough times because those tough times give me endurance so that I can continue to be that beacon of hope to people who are suffering out there. Yeah. And so the people that are in early recovery, I want you guys to focus on your walk in your faith. Mm. And that is, even if you're struggling with your faith, faith, even cry out even more to work on your health, to work on getting educated about addiction, get educated about mental illness, and just continue to build yourself up like muscles so that when your testimony is shared with somebody else, they say, oh, my God, so you were only two or three weeks clean during COVID-19 and you stayed clean the whole time? Please come help me share, share with me how you, how you did that. This is what it's all about, man. This is what it's all about. So bring on more tough times for me so yeah. I can show you how to get through it. Huh, that's good. Let's, uh, let, let's switch gears. You mentioned fitness, um, or I was thinking fitness. You were, you were going there a little bit because we're talking about you know, emotional health and, and, and mental health. And uh, mind you, I might as well point out that May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so not a, a better time to, to even be talking about this stuff. Um, <coughs> excuse me, at that. Fitness uh, for myself, for my wife, um, in the last year or so has really taken on a new thing. Um, and it's just been such a key element, key point to not only our lives, but our family's lives. Like our kids see us like going to the gym, trying to stay healthy, trying to, I mean, we don't eat perfect, man. That's probably one of my big struggles. I still love a good cheeseburger and some pizza, man. <laughs> and, um, you know, so 
but our 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 effort in that has been um, better than it's ever been, and it's such a point where when I start going down that path, like you're saying, those temptations, those um, those tough times, I can always lean on that. Like how how big for you is staying healthy, staying fit, um, and just you know physically, mentally, all that stuff combined. Well, it's number one for me. In fact, uh, because when I first got clean, man. Uh, I went and I ate a lot of sugars, ate a lot of food, and I had this huge belly. I lost all my body. And what I noticed, even especially recently during the COVID, is I was spending a lot of time alone. And so it was really hard having to go through that emotionally, all those thoughts. And so I challenged myself. And so this is for my brothers and sisters out there who are on social media. I want you to do a post and make a promise that you're going to start focusing on getting in shape. And you're going to post it and you're not going to delete it because that's exactly what I had to do because I <laughs> yeah. found myself not feeling up to get working out. But I said, okay, Vance, you know what? You need to post something and put some pressure on yourself so that you have to come back later on. Some accountability. And show that you did it. Yeah. And so that's the reason why, man, I'm <laughs> looking good. Gym. Like right now, I was trying to talk myself out of working out today. Really? Until you just said what you just now said. <laughs> <laughs> accountability. There it no. is. Yeah. So I'm going right now to the gym, which I have right here in my program, to go work out again after you do that. I, I work out five days a week, man. That's awesome. And I do as much as possible. I just continue to educate myself on mental illness. I try to see instead of um, all these fights against all this, the media where you have uh, Republicans and the Democrats, I look yeah. more on what's happening in our society that is causing people to struggle. Yeah, and good. they're losing their jobs. The families are starting to struggle. You know, you got a lot of homeless people out there that are struggling too. What can you do for somebody else to build them up during this time? Yeah. And that's another thing that I focus on. Yeah, that's good, man. That's good. Um, well, we got a few minutes left. I want to ask you one more question, and then we'll talk a little bit about where folks can get in touch with you, where they can find your book, where they can reach out if, they, uh, if they'd like to do that. Um, I just kind of wanted to, uh, to just end on um, hearing about, how your life is today. Like what, I mean, you, you've had, you've been through so much and, um, you know, now you're in this different place, the second chance that, that God has given you. Um, I, I would love to just have you share and, and just, just give that glimmer of hope for, for those out there, man, to know that there is, uh, a, there's hope, there's a chance and any, if, if Vance Johnson can do it, anybody can do it. Well, you know, what's really awesome about that brother. And so folks that are listening right now, this was not scripted. Not at all. Baby. It was not scripted. Never. And I just thank God for the question you just now asked me mm. because it leads me into this. Have you ever heard of a saying that time heals all wounds? Mm. It's a freaking lie. Time don't heal no wounds. The only thing that heals wounds is forgiveness. Because when I first got clean mm. in the 12 steps, 12, eight, nine, you're called to make amends with those who you've harmed, right? Well, Everybody not going to forgive you for what you did. And so what you need to do is give it time, but forgive. And so what I did was, man, I called my father, who I hated growing up, and said, Dad, I just want you to know that I forgive you. Hmm. And the reason why I forgive you, Dad, is because I know you had a dad. And I know you grew up in the streets and you struggled with addiction and you struggled gangbanging when you were a kid. And so you didn't even know how to be a father but I forgive you and I love you and thank you for even being in my life a little bit. My father, man, just started crying when I, when I said, I love you and I forgive you. And the other thing that that did for me was in this walk in my recovery, do you know that my children are starting to come back and forgiving me for abandoning them when they were children? They all blamed me for what happened to my son. And I used myself into a coma and almost died. And they all actually... I didn't even share that part of the story. They wanted me to die. So they all said, pull the plug on them because I was in a coma for 28 days Damn. using. But my children, man, have all started to come to say, dad, I forgive you, man. Hmm. All three of my sons who are the same age by different women have all been reunited in my life. The first daughter that I had, she's almost 35 years old right now. Do you know, brother? She showed up at the Vance Johnson Recovery Center. <laughs> no way. To tell me that she forgave me. That's awesome. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's I'm amazing. Talking, I'm talking, guys. It just takes time. And time will show because in God's grace, in prayer, and just asking him to forgive me for my sins and to restore those relationships and allowing that time to cause forgiveness to happen, that's yeah. what it's all about. 
because when we just give it time, we suppress things. But in time, if we start to learn how to grow in forgiveness and pray for those that we don't like, then eventually we start having this really awesome heart to be able to just accept things yeah, and know that life is going to be tough. And so my relationships are being restored. I still have a couple of sons actually that are still struggling a little bit out there with addiction. And I'm hoping somehow that they would eventually, you know, just reach out to dad so that I could offer something to them. And then we can maybe put their name on this facility and take mine off. That's awesome, man. That's so good, man. Thank you for sharing that too. That's good Absolutely. stuff. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, if folks want to reach out to you and, and, and um, everyone listening to, I'll make sure to put all this in the show notes. Okay. Uh, Vancecares.com. We'll put the recovery center in there as well. If you'd like to check that out. Um, if anyone wants to find you, wants to reach out uh, any, any thoughts on that or where they could do that. Yeah. Well, a couple ways. Uh, one is my Facebook page, uh, Vance Inspires, because I'm really transparent. I'm on my page every day. I did a devotional today. I do a live stream every Wednesday. And so I'm always on my page when people want to inbox me just to talk a little bit about the different options I have available, depending on what part of the country they're in. And obviously, I have my book called nice. Uncovered, Why Becoming Less Became Everything, because to me, it's about being humble and contrite and not trying to be some famous guy, man, that's trying to inspire athletes to be great but literally inspire people who are broken that they can make it through. So if you want to just reach out to me, go to Vance Cares or again, contact me on my Facebook page. I'm transparent. You can reach out to me. We can talk and we can show you the way. Good me stuff. or sober guy or both of us. Yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate you coming on today and sharing a little bit and uh, just being a great guest, man. You're awesome, dude. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. I love you, man. I love your show and I'm gonna keep on following you, brother. Right on. Thank you. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, if you want to check us out, go to thatsoberguy.com. Connect with us on Instagram, at Real That Sober Guy. We'll put those links in the show notes. Uh, Vance Johnson Recovery Center, vancecares.com, and Vance Inspires on Facebook. Uh, shout out to Promises. Thanks to, the, to those guys for partnering with us. And uh, also uh, the daily AA email. You can check that out it's in the show notes as well, too. Love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Hope something spoke to you today. Share the podcast with a friend. Peace, love, and respect, and keep your blood clean.